Our Constitution is 243 years old. We're still under the same Constitution. Other countries, the most that it's lasted in other countries is 17 years. Ours has lasted 243. How is that possible? We believed in our founding, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord's. Our founding fathers gathered together April 19, 1775 to declare their independence. The first Continental Congress, one of the pictures that you may not know of is this picture right here. They gathered and the first thing they did for two hours was pray. They gathered and, and they lifted up the country and, and which way we should go. And they gathered together and they wrote the Declaration of Independence. 161 words of freedom. Six principles of government are listed in the Declaration of Independence. 27 grievances against England because they were not living up to those six principles of government. Where did these people come up with this idea? When you look at this picture, one thing you may not realize is that's the First Continental Congress. 29 of the 56 had graduated and got their degree from a Bible seminary. Several of these people in this picture were ministers of that time, were preaching of that time, and they were great preachers like Jonathan Witherspoon, who, as historians say, was the Billy Graham of his day. How about Benjamin Rush? We have Sunday school classes today because of Benjamin Rush in the 1700s. He was one of the first ab abolitionists back in the 1700s. An historian by the name of Hezekiah Niles went 47 years after the Declaration of Independence and sat down with John Adams, the second president, and said, who are your heroes? Who are the ones that you sought after? Was it Washington? Was it Thomas Jeff? Who are the ones? And he listed eight preachers. And four of those preachers were black men. New Hampshire had the first black man in Congress during this time. Can you say today, does this describe America? If you were to take my dad's Bible, he had a little pocket Bible, the whole Bible. My dad was blind as a bat, and his Bible was this big. It was the whole Bible. No wonder he went blind trying to read it. And if you were to throw that on a table, it will automatically open up to 2 Chronicles 7.14. He had that page wore out in his Bible. He said, the healing of our nation is so simple. If my people who were called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. This promise is still true today, but today my people is the church. If my people, the church, would do these simple steps, I would heal your nation. You see, the trouble was, we were founded with the idea of presenting Christ. And one of the th reasons we were, we were presented here in the 1600s, they had a statement, we are here to further the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Not religion, but the kingdom of Jesus Christ. If you were to get out your newspaper and you would read on the front cover that the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court had issued this decree, that divine providence, which is God, has given to our people the choice of the rulers and of its duty. Of our Christian nation, it is select, to select and prefer Christians to rule over them. What would you do if you read that on your newspaper? you'd think you're listening to Fox News. <laughs> but that was what was written. And that's what John Jay, the father of the Supreme Court, said in his ruling. We need Christians to rule over us. What if you opened up your paper and you read this? It is now the law of each state requiring all elected officials to take this oath. 
I do profess faith in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ his Son. And I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures, both the Old and New Testament, to be given and divinely inspired by the Word, the Lord himself. That was written in the Delaware newspaper. That was a command and that was a ruling when we started. Or how about this, that they affirmed that Congress should set aside and recommend and approve the Bible to be taught in all schools. You would think you're going nuts if you've seen that. But one of the very first acts of Congress was this. They asked a man to get, sit down and translate an American Bible. 10,000 copies of this American Bible. And Congress read it approved it and mandated it be taught in public schools as criteria. I don't think this is where we're at today anymore. What happened, church? Our founding fathers got together for two hours and while they were together, the man by the name of Jacob Duche was the preacher reading and they read four different chapters and a four chapter Bible study. Isaiah 35 was one of them and Psalms 35 was the other one they were reading. And in the middle of reading this, Jacob Duche broke out into prayer. John Adams says of this prayer, did not your heart burn with inside of you knowing that the providence of God was going to make this nation great? They knew it was only because God was going to make America would America be made. He read these words, Contend, Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take up your shield and your armor. Arise and come to my aid. Brandish spear and javelin against those who pursue me. Say to me, I am your salvation. May those who seek my life be disgraced and put to shame. May those who plot my ruin be turned back to dismay. May they be like the chaff before the wind and the angel of the Lord divining and chasing him along the way. May the path be dark and slippery when the angel of the Lord pursues after them. Since they hid their net for me without cause and without cause digging pits for me. May ruin overtake them by surprise. May the net they hid for me, entangled them. May they fall into their own pit. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord and delight in His salvation. My whole being will explain, exclaim, who is like the Lord who rescues the poor from those who are too strong for them, the poor and the needy from those who rob them. He broke out into prayer and that verse ends, that chapter ends, my tongue will proclaim your righteousness, your praises all day long. If you were to go to Washington, D.C., the biggest monument is the Washington Monument. On top of the Washington Monument is written the words, May God be praised. Your founding fathers did that. Your founding fathers sought the Lord. America was founded on Jesus Christ. And now we send out people to go preach the gospel. Because no one's coming, so we've got to go get them. Jay Smothers was involved in a mission. And they had signed up to reach 48,000 youth. His mom and dad were headed down there this weekend to see him. They wanted to go down and see him. And he says, I'm going to be too busy. Let me finish that for you. I'm going to be too busy doing what I love. Wait. How did America come to be? We were a tag team of misfit soldiers. Very little training. Farmers using squirrel guns. Let me show you our first gunship. That'll scare you, won't it? This one ship overtook the English Navy. They were probably too busy laughing when they saw it coming. They didn't load up their guns. 
If you count, I believe it maybe has six little cannons. That's all it's got. Just a few short months after the, the war started, Thomas Jeff or Washington seen and realized that he was outgunned 25 days after it started. And he realized he was here. There was 20,000 English troops and he just had 8,000 men. And he said, we've got to get out of here somehow. And so by the cover of night, they loaded up their little boats and were crossing the Delaware. But they realized they weren't going to get everybody across and they were getting nervous. And they said, at daybreak, we're just wide open targets. What's going to happen? And they prayed to the Lord, and you will not believe this, but this is in history. All of a sudden, a dense fog came over. And they couldn't be seen. They could only see six yards in front of them. And God's providence, and George Washington talks constantly about God's providence, God directing us. John Adams talks about God being in charge, and look what God is doing for us. When was the last time we heard leaders? On the day they declared independence, John Adams wrote home to his wife, and he celebrated. The first letter was a celebration. Later on, he sat down again and he wrote again. And these are the words... I am apt to believe that this day will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. Then how should it be celebrated? Here's what he concludes. It ought to be commemorated as a day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to the Almighty God. July 4th, according to John Adams, should be a religious holiday of our independence. We see through our history that America was protected and directed by God in its founding and they were calling on God for leading and guiding and the trouble was in the 1600's when we came over here we were coming over as missions but, but in 1730 only 10 percent of those living in America were going to church. Just 10%. The freedom of religion gave us freedom from religion. So they quit attending. And so they had what was called the Great Awakening. Ministers like Jonathan Edwards and Whitefield gathered together to preach and proclaim the message. And because of their preaching, men and women came back to the Lord. Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon. You probably heard the title, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he was a monotone speaker, and he was reading his sermon, but the words were so powerful that the people were crying out for deliverance and for forgiveness, and they would have to quiet the crowd down so that he could finish his sermon. I wouldn't really call that a motivational church growth sermon. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Every one of the principles, those six principles that are listed in the Declaration of Independence, every one of those had been preached from the pulpit 20 years prior to the Declaration of Independence. They knew the only way that we were going to be a nation is because God is directing our efforts. Stories upon stories have been told about how God divinely inter intervened on America's behalf in ways that should have never have happened. Things happened that are only been able to conclude God's providential hand led the way. You see, America was founded by people who their desire was to please God. A desire to please God. Do you realize that churches are dying all over America? In an average month, 3,000 churches will close their doors. 3,000 on an average month. America is saying we no longer need God. They sure didn't say that in 9-11, did they? They sure didn't say that in 1940s when we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. Do we really want God to get our attention again? Do we really want to take that hit? Franklin and Jefferson were the two deists who signed the Declaration of Independence. Everyone else were true divine followers of Jesus Christ. They believed in His divine power. Franklin was so impressed by George Whitfield's preaching and he was impressed by the crowds that sometimes he would preach to 30,000 in Philadelphia, and at that time Philadelphia only had 25,000 in population. 
George Washington's own diary of this time. This is what George Washington handwritten his own diary. Let my heart, gracious God, be so affected with your glory and your majesty that I may discharge those weighty duties which you have given me. And I have called to thee for pardon and forgiveness of my own sins. For the sacrifice of Jesus Christ offered on the cross for me. Thou gavest thy son to die for me and thou hast given me assurance of my salvation. Wow. John Adams was so inspired by the Bible that he concludes that I have read and studied as best I can. There is no book like the Bible. He was so adamant about reading the Bible that his son John Quincy Adams fell in love with the Word of God. And John Quincy Adams was so inspired that his son fell in love with the Word of God. Why are our kids not in love with the Word of God anymore? We were trying to encourage our boys to read their Bibles and Vicki said, well, you know, you read yours in private. And I do. I, I, I like my personal private time. As a dad of boys, you don't get that very often. Any, you know, now I'm starting to get it. I, I, it's kind of like you throw the game remote downstairs with like a bunch of dogs with a bone, you know. Here, go play, you know. And, and when I was, you know, when they were younger, my private time was personal to me. And I'd sit down with my Bible and my cup of coffee. And you've got to have at least one cup of coffee before you talk to people. You know, it should be in the Bible, but it's not. I've looked. <laughs> And she said, well, maybe you should sit down and read your Bible in front of your kids as an example. And I told my wife, I said, well, maybe you should just quit being white right all the time. <laughs> Dads, moms, grandma, grandpa. Have your kids saw your love of the word? Have they come over and seen it opened on the table? Have they seen you sitting down at your favorite chair with your favorite cup of whatever, studying your word in front of them? If you love it, they'll love it. And our founding fathers were so searching the word, so intent in searching the word. This is what Samuel Adams said about the revolution. This is why we did it. We have this day restored the sovereign to whom all men ought to be obedient to. He reigns in heaven and from this rising to the setting of the sun, let his kingdom come. Samuel Adams. Our founding fathers were dramatically and emphatically and over the top believers in Almighty God and Jesus Christ. And they wanted a nation where you could praise and honor him without any stops or anybody coming in telling you to quit. Our founding was made possible by people who made themselves available. They got together in prayer, they got together in study, and then they took action. They didn't wait for someone else to do it. They took action. Let me just give you a list of some names of some of these people. How about Henry Knox? Henry Knox was a nobody. He was a 24-year-old bookseller. He goes down in history as one of the giants of the Revolutionary War. Not someone you would pick to be a leader. Nathaniel Green is another one. He's an unlikely hero. He even tried to be an officer in his own militia that he started and he didn't make it. His own militia. He taught himself military strategies by reading books and by desiring to say, I'm available. I see a cause. I will fight for the cause. What about John Stark? The average age of this time before you died was 33 years old. He was a 46-year-old farmer. Let's just say he was past his prime of the day. Some of you are getting a little mad at No, no, of the day he was past his prime. 46-year-old farmer. He come up with the phrase, live free or die. It is still New Hampshire state slogan. I'm available. I see a reason to fight. I see the cause. I'll go. 
What about Daniel Morgan? Daniel Morgan, it says, was a backwoods Virginian. Let me tell you what, I relate to this man. He was a redneck. <laughs> he was a born fighter. He was a hillbilly. He just wanted to fight. <laughs> but he saw a cause. He saw something greater than himself. I'm available. I'll go. What about Anthony Wayne? His teacher said he would not make a good student. <coughs> After the Revolutionary War, he got a nickname, Mad Anthony Wayne. The English soldiers were scared of him. You're probably telling yourself, well, those are just a few people. I have a list of hundreds of people who are willing to step up and say, I'm available, let me be part of this. And because each individual person did their part, we live in a free country today. And you know what makes the generals look good? It's the privates behind them doing the work. It's the ones that's on the battlefield, the ones that's in the gutters, the ones that's in the trenches, the ones that's doing the fighting. I could tell you about William Doss or Dr. John Joseph Warren. I could go on and tell you about Crispus Atkins or Nancy Hart. Or how about Pedro Francisco? Or I could tell you about um, Betsy Hager or Ladacia Langston or Hannah Arnett. All these people who were nobodies. Nobodies. Who made themselves available. I see a cause. Here I am. I'll do the fight. You're probably telling yourself you're just one person, but that's more important than what you think. I gotta get to this. It ain't there, I don't worry about that. Let me go to this. If anyone then knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, Now we can talk about sexual sins, we can talk about drug abuse, we can talk about all these other sins, but let me tell you what James just said. If anyone then knows the good that he ought to do and he doesn't do it, if anyone does not make himself available, if anyone is not seeing the cause, something greater than themselves, and you're just saying, well, I'm just one person. One vote made Oliver Cromwell Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of the Great England in 1645. One vote executed Charles I in 1649. One vote in 1800 kept Aaron Burr, who was later charged with treason, from becoming president. One vote in 1800 made Thomas Jefferson the president. One vote in 1839 elected Marcus Morton governor of Massachusetts. One vote in 1845 made Texas the great state, part of our union. One vote in 1686 made Andrew Jackson from impeachment. One vote in 1850, in 1889, and 1890 made a California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho part of the union. One vote saved President Andrew Johnson from impeachment in 1868. One vote in 1875 ended the monarchy of France and made it a republic, a democracy. One vote in 1876 elected Rutherford B. Hayes president of the United States. During that time it was one vote of the Electoral College that was cast by one representative from Indiana. One. One. One vote gave Hitler control of the Nazi party. One. One vote in 1993 allowed the largest tax hike in U.S. history. One. Well, I'm just one person. One song can spark a moment. One flower can wake in a dream. One tree can start a forest. One bird can herald a spring. One smile begins a friendship. One hand clasp lifts the soul. One star will guide the ship at sea. One word can frame the goal. One vote can change the nation. One sunbeam of light restores the room. One candle wipes out darkness. One laugh conquers fear and gloom. One step starts each journey. One word must start the prayer. One hope will raise our spirits. One touch can show you care. One voice can speak with wisdom. One heart can know what's true. One life can make a difference. Will you be the one? Story 
of the man went to a college and in the college he was declaring that atheism was true and that people that believe in God were idiots and morons and he challenged anyone to change his mind and he embarrassed them with his beliefs and his facts that he had everyone was quiet and full of fear by his words and his appearance except for one lady in the crowd in the balcony he started singing, Arise, arise, you Christian soldiers, you soldiers of the cross. Lift high the royal banner, that much not suffer loss. And after she sang the first verse, then the whole balcony began to sing, and then the whole auditorium began to sing. And when they finally got done, there was, that guy was gone. He was scared for his life because of Christian soldiers. One. Jace was one man. And he influenced so many in 19 years. One. Let's be honest, he influenced more in 19 years than most of us and influenced in the rest of our lives. He went out of his way and, and he might have ticked some of them off. But he knew the urgency ahead of him. If any one man knew, if any one man was ready to reap a reward, one. One church can start a revival. Will it be this church? One step down that aisle will change your life forever. Will today be the day you make that one step? Church, will today be the day that you make that decision that this church will be the one to turn America back around again? That's your choice. Almighty God, as we are here at this time, I want to thank you. I'm 47 years old and I still learned from a 19-year-old young man. Thank you for his fire, his excitement, that huge smile. Father, thank you that you allowed that one man to influence so many others. That there are people who have went through the watery grave of baptism because of Jace making that decision to speak up and to speak out. Father, if there's someone here today that needs to take that one step down the aisle, let it be today, Father. Father, if there's someone here that needs to straighten up their home life, let today be that one day that they change the course of their history. Father, if there's ever a church that's going to change America, let it be this one church. Let us, Father, lead the way. I pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Will you stand with me?